Ryan Reynolds here for, I guess, my hundredth mint commercial. No, 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 don't, no, don't, no. I mean, honestly, when I started this, I thought I only have to do like four of these. I mean, it's unlimited premium wireless for $15 a month. How are there still people paying two or three times that much? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be victim blaming here. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash save whenever you're ready. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See details. Today on CityCast DC. November 2024 has been a month with a good amount of headlines. In the barrage of national news, some of which obviously has a super intense local impact, you might have missed some pretty big DC headlines. So I'm here with senior producer Julia Karen to get you up to speed. Today is Tuesday, November 26th. I'm senior executive producer Priyanka Tove, and here's what DC is talking about. Hey, Julia. Hey, Priyanka. How's it going? Just trying to get to the holiday, you know. Grateful for Thanksgiving around the corner. It feels like the last three and a half, four weeks have just been an onslaught. It's been a lot. My brain has melted multiple times. It's fine. For people who are first-time listeners, most episodes of CityCast DC are an interview between one of our hosts, Mike or Bridget, and one guest. Sometimes it's us, sometimes it's like a local reporter, journalist, expert, focusing on one topic. But What we've noticed is that even though we are a daily podcast, there are stories that we never get to put on air. And so we started doing this episode the last Tuesday of every month where we run through a bunch of stories that were not critical enough to make it into full episodes. That's what we're doing today, stories you missed in November. We have a really fun format. We cover eight stories, three minutes each, and we use my handy dandy workout timer. It does feel like a workout. Like I feel like by the end, we're always out of breath. Cardio intervals is what we're going for here. And also also mental intervals because we switch back and forth so often between topics. I'm ready to get started when you are. Let's do it. All right. Let me start the timer. Let's go. Priyanka, occasionally I'll hit up, you know, call your mother, the Jew-ish deli. They do a decent bagel. They do an okay breakfast sandwich. Is it my favorite? No. But do they provide something in time of need? Yes. The one in Georgetown... <laughs> I feel like this story won't go away. You know where I'm going with this. Was sued by residents because of long lines going out the door. There were rats. There were general, like, bad vibes going on at the Georgetown Call Your Mother location. Recently, the owners scored a huge win against the effort to get rid of them. City zoning officials voted four to one to keep them there and said the owners made efforts to manage crowd control and trash. Some of the things they're going to look forward to, according to the Washington Post, are weekly pest control visits, daily trash collection, signs asking customers to eat off-site and more. Call Your Mother has already deputized an employee to be on stoop patrol in charge of asking customers to move. (laughs) They're taking it seriously, man. I got to commend the effort, and I'm glad that it was seen. I'm not the biggest Call Your Mother fan, but I think that the problems they are dealing with are issues that every single restaurant and business in D.C. I feel like struggles with. It's like it's hard to blame them for the rats. The rats are everywhere. That is sort of the price you pay to live in a city with real amenities, right? I live in Cleveland Park. I see rats occasionally when I'm walking towards the Target if I have to pick something up. That's kind of the nature of living in a big city. You've got to deal with a little bit of that. The neighbors are still mad about this. There's plans to appeal this decision. This is a story that's never going to die. Will the Call Your Mother in Georgetown actually ever die or live going into the new year? I don't know, man. (laughs) When did this location open up? Do you know? Uh, A couple of years ago. Okay. So it's been there for a minute. I just feel like we've been hearing about this zoning issue all year long. It's been at least a few months. Priyanka, you're a New Jersey girl, so you know a good New York bagel when you see one. If they put a real New York bagel shop there, do you think people would stop complaining? I don't think it's about the bagels. I think it's that Call Your Mother for some reason does have this cultish following in D.C. All of the locations generate so much popularity. And I think it's about the lines and the chaos that ensues. I mean, that's a successful business. It's hard to fault them for being successful. That doesn't seem fair. All this to say, can't wait to uh, discuss the fact that this story will never go away. When we come back for stories you missed in December, we will talk about it again, I'm sure. Round two. 
too. Okay, so our next story is unfortunately President Trump related. There is a call from one, at least one um, Airbnb host in the DC area to have a blackout around inauguration. Um, She's calling for uh, all Airbnb hosts in the DC area to shut down their rentals for the weekend of inauguration, which also is a long weekend. It's um, MLK Day, I believe. This is a hard sell, I think, because January isn't the most popular time for people to visit DC. I'm assuming that people who are renting out apartments on Airbnb crave income during that time. It must be a, a hard business period. And every four years, inauguration helps provide that for them. It, it gives Airbnb hosts a much needed income boost. But this year, DC famously very much voted for Kamala Harris. Um, It was like 92% of people here voted for Kamala Harris. There isn't a lot of love for Trump. There isn't a lot of um, excitement about his inauguration this coming January. And there is fear or frustration about the city being overrun with Trump supporters. And so, yeah, there's this push to have a blackout. What do you think about that? Mixed bag, man. On the one hand, get that money. Charge out the nose. Yeah, I should say the thing that they're petition, like the thing that they're calling for uh, these Airbnb hosts is to either have hosts take their rentals off the market entirely, or increase their prices significantly and donate the profits to liberal causes. So there is that angle to it. I'm mixed on this, man. I think Airbnbs are kind of weird to start. I've had weird experiences at Airbnbs where like there's certain rules you have to follow or like if you aren't sure about how many people you're bringing, it's a whole thing. I know New York City has really clamped down on them because they don't like it. I don't know if DC has done something similar. It is not. It is not. So I actually wonder if this will be a time where because this is happening, DC finally clamps down on weird Airbnb shenanigans. If you're trying to rent it out to people, but you're charging an exorbitant fee, DC officials will be like, don't love that. Who knows? In 2021, Airbnb did block and cancel reservations in the DC area because of inauguration. Obviously, that was in the wake of January 6th. I guess we'll see if they generate any sort of policy on this this time around. So speaking of policies and generating headlines, the Washington Post Recently had numbers come out around cancellations because of Jeff Bezos, who owns the paper's non-endorsement. That number is in the 250K range, which is so many people. And that might be undercounting. Uh, There's annual subscriptions that might have bought and canceled too. Pretty sure that that's bad for business. But in terms of actual policy stuff, publisher Will Lewis is demanding that folks come back to the office five days a week. There is a tweet going around from Max Tanney that has an email from Lewis saying that If people don't want to come back to the office five days a week, they could simply resign. (laughs) Per the email, Lewis wants all managers back in the office by February 3rd, 2025. For everyone else, the date is June 2nd, 2025. He has this whole thing about how, yeah, we're giving you more than six months to figure this out. And it's like, okay, man, but do you know reporters? When I was at the Post and I was a stringer and I had to cover like high school track and field, I'm not going to drive back three hours to the office to write my story. I don't know. It feels like a weird policy, especially for reporters. Yeah, I am curious about how that balance is going to be enforced. Can reporters just say, I'm out in the field reporting? Like, don't expect me in the office because I'm literally doing my job. To some extent, that is valid. I'm sure also there are people that would say that when they're not actually reporting because they want to work from home, which also is fair because we've all gotten used to a certain lifestyle in the last four years. I'm curious about how this is going to be enforced for sure. Yeah. What do you do if your reporter is just like out in the field five days a week? Do you demand that they step one toe into the office? Where is the line here? Like for editors, I think it's probably like, okay, like, yes, five days in office per week. For the social team, maybe it's five days in office Designers, per week. Sure. Yeah. If you're a reporter, your entire job is to be out in the community. Maybe they will make exceptions for them. I guess we'll have to see. But it is interesting that this is coming at the same time that the federal government, Trump, is talking about requiring all employees to come back to the office. I guess downtown's about to see a lot of activity. Yeah. I don't think this problem is going away because of COVID. I think businesses are going to have to adjust to people not wanting to come to the office all the time. Have you ever tried a squid ink margarita? What about a cotton candy old-fashioned? DC's bartenders are constantly raising the bar with wacky and delicious new cocktails, 
And what better way to try out their creations than during this year's Cocktail Week? This year's celebration is running Friday, November 29th through Thursday, December 5th, the 91st anniversary of Repeal Day. Whether you like a classic martini or a mixologist's strangest specials, DC Cocktail Week has something for everyone, with over 100 participating locations in DC, Maryland, and Virginia. Warm your belly this fall with special happy hours and tasting events from some of DC's best restaurants. Visit dccocktailweek.com for details. That's dccocktailweek.com. Cheers. The world comes to Washington, D.C. this December. Join us for the 11th annual Winter National Embassy Showcase at the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center on December 5th. Presented by World Trade Center Washington, D.C., Winter National offers a -a one-of-a-kind experience featuring representatives from over 60 embassies, promoting their countries through vibrant and interactive displays of visual art, food, and handcrafts, as well as travel, tourism, and trade. Attendees can shop the marketplace for artisanal goods like jewelry and hats, or ceramics and hand-carved wood sculptures. Sample cultural delicacies and explore countries' exhibits featuring arts and culture, commodities, and diaspora communities in traditional dress. Don't miss this free, lively midday celebration. Register at rrbitc.com slash winternational. All right, our next story is about the 911 call center, which we've reported on extensively as being less than ideal. They've had a lot of issues with calls getting dropped, emergency services not getting where they're supposed to go in a timely manner. Now, the Office of Unified Communications, which is which runs the 911 call center, has come out with what they're calling the Make the Right Call campaign, where they're encouraging people to use 311 for issues that don't require an emergency response. So they say that there have been 1.2 million 911 calls in the 2024 fiscal year, and that a quarter of those were non-emergency. Those non-emergency calls clutter up the hotline and make it harder to get care to emergencies in a timely fashion. And so they're saying, like, use 911 for emergencies that are ongoing, like a fire or someone's having a heart attack or you're literally being... Robbed, like your store is in the process of being robbed right now. Um, But use 311 for anything else. Like the robbery has ended and you're calling to report it. There's been vandalism. You know that there's been an incident of fraud. They want you to call 311. I understand conceptually the distinction, but it also feels a little bit like a cop out for a call center that's just like beleaguered and struggling and needs more systemic fixes, I think. Oh, for sure. Do I think moving a quarter of the non-emergency emergencies to 311 helps? Maybe, possibly. Like, if you're talking about a rat pancake in front of your apartment building that you want cleaned up, yeah, I don't think 911 warrants getting called for that. But I don't think people are calling for that. That's the thing. Right. That is the other thing, though. I feel like offloading a quarter of these, I don't know that it solves the immediate issue of there's lines getting dropped. You're li- You literally had a moment where you were signing onboarding bonuses and giving people extra money to complete their shifts all in a week. Right. Like staff shortages. This doesn't solve that. Also, the number that people call for emergencies that is advertised all the time is 911. So how are you going to have to advertise 311 for all these non-emergency emergencies? I mean, that's literally what they're doing here. This this is us advertising for them. All right, we've got more general snafu stuff going around in D.C. So D.C. has an emergency rental assistance program. This came up during the pandemic when, as people might not so fondly remember, it was possible that you maybe sort of could have gotten evicted if you didn't pay your rent on time. Landlords were allowed to do that. During the pandemic, what ended up happening was people had that delayed. And that was, we think, a good idea. People weren't making money. They wanted to have housing that's fine. Now that the pandemic is ostensibly over, the issue at hand is that DC has a ton of people who need rental assistance and have applied for the program, but basically can't get it. It's it's a huge mess. A bunch of these people gathered to tell the council to literally get it together. The council had a hearing to figure out its effectiveness. Currently, Phil Mendelson, the chairman, uh, are saying they want to bring back the before times emergency rental requirement. You need to provide paperwork. 
in a timely manner. Also, you can maybe possibly get evicted even if the resident has been approved for the assistance that would cover the unpaid rent. He wants to reapprove those because landlords are saying that they are way behind on people paying rent. So this is something that is not going away. It also comes at a time when the emergency rental assistance program's funding got cut almost in half. It was at 63 million last year. An emergency bill this year cut the funding to 27 million. So fewer people are gonna get assistance but need that money. It's hard because I feel like D.C. is in such a difficult housing situation. We've reported before about the way landlords are feeling. Typically, D.C. has had a reputation for being very tenant-friendly and having strong tenant protections. Some people have said it has swung too far in that direction. And now we have situations where landlords aren't getting paid rent, like significant portions of their buildings aren't paying. And then that then leads to the apartment's kind of falling into disarray because the landlords don't have the funds to maintain them properly. So then people are living in kind of like slum-like conditions, which is also obviously not good. But then that sometimes creates a ripple effect of people withholding rent because the building is slum-like conditions. A lot of DC housing has fallen into this vicious cycle, and it seems like the council is considering some pro-landlord policies to try and right it. But understandably, that's also going to lead to backlash because it it seems like it's pulling back assistance. The knock-on effects here are real and serious. And I'm wondering if in the next year, in 2025, we're going to see what ERAP does. So who's to say? This is a happier story. In Chinatown, we have reported on and heard lots of complaints about the fact that Chinatown does not have a good market. In fact, D.C. generally doesn't have that many East Asian markets in the city itself. They're largely in the suburbs. We've got H Mart, obviously. But in D.C., as far as I know, there's Hana Market and there's Rice Market, and they're both far away from Chinatown. I mean, you know, relatively, it's everything's kind of close in D.C. We did an episode earlier this year with WAMU's Amanda Gomez about how people who live in Chinatown, especially a bunch of seniors in Wallach House, take buses to the suburbs to get their groceries because there isn't a market in Chinatown itself. And so Kevin Tian, really popular chef in D.C., he's the person behind Moon Rabbit, he wants to remedy this. He has announced plans to open up a new market in Chinatown. It'll have a, like, basic grocery stocked with Asian snacks and noodles and like pantry staples, produce, etc. There will also be prepared foods and sauces and ready to cook items. It's intended to be like a community and cultural space as well. So there'll be like a front facing food stall that doubles as a mentorship space. There'll be a tasting room in the back. And there will also be a bakery and cafe run by Moon Rabbit's pastry chef, James Beard finalist. Her name is Susan Bay. So it sounds like it's going to be a really fun place. I'm very excited about it. I love Asian grocery stores. I don't think we have enough in the city. And it'll be nice to have something in Chinatown that feels representative of a Chinatown as opposed to what we've got right now, which is a place that's largely like Starbucks and Chick-fil-A with Chinese characters on it. I already foresee, for the record, this front-facing food stall being mobbed during Wizards and Caps game days. Like, you know, I feel like that is going to be the thing that draws people to it, and then they'll get curious about it and be like, ooh, like, maybe I should poke inside. I don't know how many people in downtown Chinatown will actually be like, ah, yes, like, I need X specific soy sauce or whatever to go with my stuff. But it's possible that a lot of people in that area do. There are a lot of residences in the area. I I know a lot of people who live in apartment buildings around there, so I'm sure they'll be psyched about it. I also have faith in Kevin Tan's ability to do this. His family ran a grocery store in Louisiana, which is where he's from, and he's planned a lot of like Asian night markets around town. So yeah, here's hoping. I'm excited for good food, period. That's what I'm excited for, you know? Yeah. We came out with an episode earlier this year that was very popular about ethnic grocery stores around town. Um, We'll link to it in the show notes, but... Maybe it's time for an update. Other good news that's going on. I don't know if people know what Berry Farm is, but it was a huge public housing development that had, you know, a ton of people living in it, a lot of concentrated poverty. The mayor, Mayor Bowser and co, basically, and advocates, wanted better housing for folks in the area. Then they had to literally move people out of these apartment complexes. Right now, they've torn down some of Berry Farms. They're preserving a few of the buildings for historic preservation purposes. The goal is essentially that by 2030, all of the old Berry Farm residents will get to move back into the nice new buildings that are there, which will consist of mixed use stuff. So retail on the bottom, living stuff on top. Mayor Bowser cut the ribbon on one of the buildings that's part of this 
new development. It's called the Asbury. She also shoveled dirt at a site next door for what will be called the Edmondson. Uh, and the goal is that by next year, uh, the two buildings will bring 247 new units of housing to the Berry Farm neighborhood where that plan to revitalize the community is like slowly but surely happening. So like kind of good news. It's happening. Yeah. And as we talked about earlier, we are in desperate need (laughs) for good housing news. Little itty bitty thing, but like hopefully has a bigger impact. A lot of the people who were worried they would get displaced, some of the former residents can essentially go and move in when they need to. There's set zoning that says that like it's for people who formerly were at Berry Farms. There was a woman in this article whose parents actually passed away, but she is getting a unit at the Asbury as part of this. So like really trying to find a way to make sure that the community stays intact, really trying to find a way to get them into good, solid, legitimate housing. Overall, big fan. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I really appreciate that intentionality around this. And that is something that advocates argued for for a long time. They didn't want it to just get like blown up and then they get displaced, which I think is par for the course when gentrification happens. I think the people were just like, we want real housing. Mm -hmm. We want housing that is safe and affordable and good uh, and hopefully this delivers on that kind of promise. And again, it's slow going. Like this stuff isn't going to be done until potentially 2030. That's a long time from now. But Berry Farm could look completely different in what, six, five years from now? It's crazy. Remind me exactly where in town this is. Berry Farm, it's a neighborhood in southeast Washington. It's located east of the river. It's bounded by the Southeast Freeway to the northwest, the Suitland Parkway to the northeast and the east, and the St. Elizabeth's Hospital facility area to the south. So it's like kind of like crunched under near almost like the joint base at Anacostia Bowling. Okay. And and we've talked about other developments that are being uh, considered in that area. So exciting times. Last round. Okay. Sunday. I was leaving my apartment, which is very close to Malcolm X Park, and I heard cheering. As I walked past the park, I saw hordes of people, mostly women, all packed together and cheering periodically. It would be like, silence, 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 big cheer. It was not a protest. I was like, what's going on? Turns out it was a Jack Schlossberg lookalike contest. Who is that? He is JFK's grandson. So he's part of the Kennedy family. He's been called the, quote, people's princess for his pretty boy good looks. He's apparently very charismatic. And he... They, people say, like, brings, like, a playful energy to politics. So, like, like a young JFK. Got it. And these lookalike contests have become a bit of a phenomenon across the country over the past month or so. I feel like I've been seeing lookalike contests, but it's, like, mostly for celebrities. Of course, DC would pick a uh, cute but obscure political rando. Yeah, exactly. It's, like, it's very classic. Apparently, hundreds of college-aged DC residents attended this event. Over 1,200 people had RSVP'd. And so for about half an hour, they were trotting out like lookalikes one by one, asking them Schlossberg trivia questions and cheering about how closely they did or did not represent Jack Schlossberg. And so I guess that's what the cheering was. They must have been like determining based on cheers who would win. The winner turned out to be this guy named Daniel Bonomo. He's 25 years old. He's a graduate student at Georgetown. People were very dismayed to find that he does indeed already have a girlfriend. Sorry to say for any listeners out there who want to stalk him. Not that we condone stalking. Don't do that. But as the winner, he got to take home a $50 cash prize, a $100 zip car gift card, and a $100 gift card to the restaurant Salazar. I just think it's hilarious that DC decided to do this. This is wild. Can the real Schlossberg please stand up? Was he (laughs) even there? Did he help crown the winner? He had teased that he might attend. He was aware that this was happening. But no, he was apparently at some, like, event in New York City instead, according to his Instagram. I will also say, I saw photos of this. How desperate are we as single women that people were holding (laughs) I'm single signs in the crowd? Guys, come on. We can do better than a a Schlossberg look like. I'm convinced. (laughs) Dating in D.C. There you have it. Okay, those were our eight stories. How are you feeling? I mean, it flew by. It did. Always does. Time is also going to fly between now and December 9th. So we're, we want to start teasing it now that on December 9th, we're going to have our CityCast 6 episode coming out. That is our annual awards. We've put out call outs for people to vote on our six categories. Politics, food and drink, business and development, arts and culture, music, 
and your local hero. We have assembled a panel to discuss based on the shortlist that we compiled through our research, and we will be crowning winners of our own on December 9th. Make sure to tune in for that. We are very excited about it. The other thing that you should be excited about is becoming a member of CityCast DC. Because for as little as $8 a month, you get ad-free listening, you get an exciting events-only newsletter from our girl Kayla, who writes our newsletter, Hey DC. She's kind of our team celebrity. It's a big deal. Yeah, you get that email every week, by the way, every Monday. You also get first dibs access to our live events. So instead of having to wait with 1,200 people for a <laughs> Schlossberg lookalike contest, you get immediate access, which is kind of great. Go to membership.citycast.fm and become a member. Should be a good time. Truly. Thanks, Julia. Thanks, Priyanka. That's all for today here on CityCast DC. If you enjoyed the show, text your friend who went to the Schlossberg lookalike contest and tell her you've got something more worth her time. We'll be back Monday morning with more news from around the city. Bye. Too mean? No, it's so good. Okay. <laughs>